<laughs> Let's just throw all the stereotypes. If we're not pissing somebody off, we're not doing the podcast right. No. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 135, for Thursday, the 20th of July, 2017. This is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos. Uh, I should probably turn the little thing on right here so we can actually see who's who. I'm Amos. That's Kent. And in between us is Manuel. How y'all doing tonight? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Man, that was a great intro. <laughs> With my cameras all jacked up, man. This is a this is already going good. It's already a good night. It's already happening. Um, Smooth. Now, uh, now, okay. So if you're listening to this or you're watching this or or whatever you happen to be painfully consuming this with, um, you know me and Kent, but you don't know this uh, this this dude in the middle here. Uh, which, by the way, the picture that's showing on the screen is exactly what he looks like because he only showed us half his face. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I met Manuel because uh, I, I do a podcast called Undaunted, where I interview <coughs> other podcasters uh, who have interesting stories. And he stepped up to the plate and, and said he'd love to tell his story. And it was a great episode. And after the words, I was like, hey, man, you got to come on the show so we can laugh and have a good time and, and make fun of things. And he said, well, when can I come on? Mm-hmm. And we figured yeah, out, yeah, that's, uh, we figured that's out the, next, the next Friday holiday. And here it is. So. Uh, you, you took a nap and got up for us, and we appreciate that, Manuel. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And we if I out. don't sound uh, too sharp today, I, uh, it's 4 a.m. here in Belgium, uh, and we have national holiday tomorrow, so that's the reason I'm uh, I'm on live. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We're glad to have you. This is this is great. I love when we can get guests on, which is you know, fairly often, uh, but when especially when we can get an international guest on, I... I I just love it. It always turns out to be some of my favorite shows. There's something about a perspective that's not American that makes Americans really feel American. <laughs> mm, yeah, there's something about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so we're going to celebrate some things geek, and I've got just one big thing that was really geeky this week, man. Me and all the kids played D&D like several times this last Whoa. week. Uh, that's wow. great. Holy I crap. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, they, they've, they've done everything wrong so far. They ran away from the <laughs> goblins. They didn't follow the map. They got to the town, spent the night, and then left without asking about any rumors or any information. They pissed off the one guy that was supposed to be happy to see them. Um, they, like, it, it, like, they'd done everything wrong. And finally, like right before the last session ended, it suddenly clicked. And they're like, hey, we need to clear out this cave. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, put your DMing skills to the test is what you're saying. Oh my gosh, I, I went into it with with uh, with you know oh, with with vigor, man. I was going in there. I had had voices. I was doing like all the things that you're supposed to do as a DM. And like halfway through it, I just had my thumb crammed so far into my eyeball, like I was tickling the back of my ear. It was just I was so frustrated. But I did. But it was their first time. I couldn't get mad at them. I was just like, man, this is. You know, because mm-hmm. it, it would always be one person would be like, hey, we should follow the goblins and, and see where they go. And all, everybody else would be like, no, no, mm-hmm. we're going to keep going. And then the next situation, someone else would make the common sense call like, hey, we should search the, the, the corpses of the horses. And the, uh, everybody else would be like, no, we're just going to keep going. You know, <laughs> it was always like one person making the right call and everybody else just overriding that person every single time. <laughs> And well, have you played Dungeons and Dragons or any other role playing game for that matter? Uh, I, I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons very, very long time ago. I know how it goes. And um, I've played another one. It's Mage something, Mage Knight, hmm. uh, which uh, takes uh, about eight hours to complete even uh, the most simple uh, objective. <laughs> so n- that's a bit of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so no, in short, I don't play these games uh, that uh, much. But I do play uh, uh, card games like Star Realms or Epic Card Game uh, from uh, White Wizards. And um, if I play that in um, local game store, of course, there are always uh, people uh, playing role-playing games as well. So I'm a bit uh, familiar with it. But yeah, nice. it's, it's very time consuming, but uh, lots of uh, fun, apparently. Yeah. Kent, have you uh, have you played fifth edition yet? 
I very briefly yeah. uh, with Lucas. So my oldest son Lucas is really into Dungeons and Dragons, and when he was first starting to get into it, uh, I went through the character creation process, and uh, we put each other through a couple little scenarios and whatnot. But but a full as far as like a full adventure, no. Hmm. Well, I mean, you don't really remember 3.0 or 3.5 or or anything else because you barely played hardly any of them. Like you, you'd you'd play like a section at a time, but you weren't really hardcore like some of us. And I got to say, fifth edition is like 3.5 except streamlined. It's uh, it takes the best of 3.5 and kind of just streamlines some of the uh, more more tedious parts, and it's pretty awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, very good. So that's my thing. I'm, uh, mm. I'm out. Go ahead and uh, finish talking, y'all, because uh, I, I got nothing else to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just gone yeah. through your... Yeah, I, I, I just shot my load right off the bat, and I'm done. I'm, uh, like, uh, <laughs> well, no. I, the geekiest thing I did this week, I think... Well, this is a very nerdy week for me, but if I had to pick one, I would say it was watching Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, have either of you seen it? Mm-mm. Nope, not yet. Uh That'd be, a really? Mar- that'd be a Marvel movie, right? Yes. Uh, very, very good. Well, I thought you'd seen uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Didn't you watch Guardians? Barely. Okay. The, well, fir- the first one, barely. I watched Logan. But Logan okay. Logan was a good movie regardless of, of MCU or not. Like That was just a, a stellar and outstanding movie. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, well, this movie was, was very far from that. It was very much the adventurous... You know what you expect from a Spider-Man movie uh, that happened to be in the MCU world, hmm. and I, I enjoyed the hell out of it, man. It is so much fun. It adds just it's it's so good. One thing that I want to point out: it is not an origin movie. It seems every Spider-Man no, movie finally uh, has to retell the the spider bite and the death of Uncle Ben and all that kind of crap, and. It, it skips right over that. It accurately assumes that the audience already knows that stuff and gets right into the adventure. Nice. Yeah. It's really good. That's very good because there is too much uh, backstory and origin stories uh, going on uh, lately. Yeah. Oh, what, uh, what kind of nerdy things did you get into this week, Memo? Uh, literally, the, the geekiest thing I did uh, this week was logging into a uh, shell account which uh, displayed a sort of ASCII art uh, celebrating their 30th birthday. And then you realize you're old <laughs> <laughs> and um, geeky. So uh, that, uh, well, <laughs> not, not very exciting, but okay. Uh, and also I, um, uh, I used some dice uh, to, uh, to generate a private uh, key for a Bitcoin address. I just wanted to try if that uh, was... Uh, Possible and yes, it is. So no, that was rather geeky. Yeah, and I, I, um, I, could, I could help you with that. Yeah, dice <laughs> indeed. I have about uh, a box full of them here, and uh, well, if you put ninety-nine uh, dice rolls there, then uh, you can generate a key. Just want to try that. <laughs> um, yeah, very exciting life here in Belgium. We roll <laughs> dice and. Generate uh, private keys. For people. <laughs> <laughs> you guys realize well, there, w- there was a heat wave here, and well, it has its uh, effects on people. Oh sure, sure. Uh, did you guys realize forty-eight years ago today, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon? No, it's been almost mm. fifty years since we have achieved, if you will, interstellar travel. Well, intrastellar travel. Yeah. <clears throat> That's uh, uh, mm-hmm. pretty- no, I didn't realize it was. Uh, was that only forty-eight years ago? Right, because because yeah. Kent it and I sounds both, older. Kent and I both just turned forty this year, so it's like uh, that, that wasn't very long ago, dude. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, indeed. July twentieth, nineteen sixty-nine. Whoa, that's awesome. I, I'm really looking forward to going somewhere other than the moon because it's been almost half century since we got to the moon and yeah we we went back there a couple of times but we haven't been to the moon since the 70s mm-hmm. and we sure haven't gone anywhere else you know why <laughs> <laughs> because it never happened uh, uh no no not going there uh, 
<laughs> yeah, because yeah, we, we got high resolution cameras now. You can't fake that shit as good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we man. won't go to the moon again until CGI catches up with reality. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, or until they get the okay. <laughs> Right, yeah. Like okay, yeah. you can you can return again. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's fascinating stuff. In fact, um, it it always fascinated me that they didn't return there and build like bases or or yeah whatever. Uh, it, it, just because we can, <laughs> it, it it's not even like okay, does it make economic uh, sense or can we learn a lot from it or whatever? would be just cool to say well we have a permanent moon base there for doing experiments or or stargazing or whatever so it would be cool just I, I to say the, like uh, okay we can do that yeah and i think the the i think you kind of hit, hit it the reason that we haven't been back in quite some time is that there's really no return on investment like mm. we collect the moon rocks we you know investigated the place there's not a whole lot more that we can learn about the moon and we're not getting anything from it. It's not like we're mining the moon for mm-hmm. resources. Or that. So it costs so much money to send people there, and it's incredibly dangerous. And we're not really getting anything back on it. So I well, think that's the reason we haven't been back. That in the ISS. I mean, it costs so much less to go to the ISS than it does to go to the moon. It's less dangerous. takes less time. But it's not nearly as damn cool, man. We should have a base on, on the moon, man. <laughs> No, exactly. Elon Morris, of course. Elon Musk and and uh, smart brain people like that are going to get us on Mars in the next couple of decades. So, nah, we can look forward to that. How bad would the moon feel if we were like making bases on the Mars, like just enter <laughs> enter more make the moon a person? <laughs> Man, <laughs> anthropomorphize the, the moon would sue us. Right, the moon would be like, hey, hey. Uh, what, what what's going on? You're ruining my view of the Earth with all this trash you're putting out there, and now you're not even visiting me anymore. You're gonna go over to Mars, like Mars has got so much so much better stuff than I've got. Like you're going all the way out there and you're skipping by me. Oh, you're just gonna land on me and move along with life, huh? Yeah, I'm just I'm just I'm just last year's girl, right? What, what's going on with that? <laughs> You know, you know I, what? I think I'm, I'm going to lower my orbit slowly and crash in on you. <laughs> I'm going to just wreck your your tidal wave situation. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm okay, just- I'm, I'm calling it now. I am <clears throat> I am calling it now. The year after we land on Mars, we have a tsunami like nobody's business. Yeah, probably. Calling it now. The moon's going to be pissed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's gonna the go aliens inside the moon will just press a button and, and it will be all over. All you gotta do is push the moon like three feet closer to the Earth and it'll just screw up our tiles completely. <laughs> They're on Mars. Do it. <laughs> oh, uh, so while we're while we're talking about geeky stuff, though, I do want to I want to bring up a major announcement that uh, hit the geek world on Sunday. Uh, do you guys? Well, I already know Amos's answer, but uh, Manuel, do you watch Doctor Who at all? Uh, I, I watched it in uh, the first seasons. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. So did you did you hear the announcement that was made this week? Yeah, indeed. I saw the trailer as well. Okay. Yeah. So for those somehow not in the know, they announced that the thirteenth. Wait! 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 Okay. Let's 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 cut over here to. Uh, <laughs> To whatever this is going to be. Wait, that's not the right one. Um, where's the, this one? Okay, let's cut to this one. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead and, go ahead and play. This is um, someone's reaction. To- the new doctor is a girl! There you go. Uh, so that's, that's a little girl watching the announcement. They did like a, a, like a minute-long little uh, announcement teaser, if you will. And right at the end of it, they revealed who the new doctor is going to be. And it's uh, Jodie Whittaker, who, yes, mm-hmm. is a woman. Uh, and this is the first time, obviously, the doctor has been played by a woman. Uh, so the major yeah. announcement obviously had a, a, a split reaction. Now, um, I th- I'm not a Whovian at all. Like, I've never actually watched a complete and full episode but my understanding from reading the reactions and the articles about this is that the doctor is 
like intentionally not not stuck to a specific gender or a specific anything. It's like the doctor can mm-hmm, be indeed. pretty much anything, right? Like this is not a th- this is not outside of canon. No, not not in the least. Uh, yeah, I mean, up to this point, the doctor hasn't been a woman, but other time lords have presented themselves as women. Okay, uh, so this is not in any way outside of the case. So this is just pure misogyny if you're not into being a chick. Yeah, for the most part, I, I think. Maybe they were uh, initially surprised and, and, okay, that's understandable because we had like 14 or 12 or whatever doctors um, played by a male actor and now it's a woman. And I, to be honest, I, I wasn't surprised myself or, or I reacted. I only saw the reactions on, on social media like, oh, this is a thing, but it, it, it doesn't matter to me any, anyway. And as you said, it's it's in character or it's within the bounds of the story. So whatever, uh, it's, it's okay uh, for me. I would be really happy if uh, they would drop the silly British accents. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, that, that's the not, only thing yeah. really bothering so, me about Doctor Who, but okay. so, so that why would is be it, why a major is it, upheaval. Like, yeah. Why is it that the Doctor can be male, woman, or male, female, whatever, any age, but it has to be British? Like, what is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> problem of mine, too. I was like, well, you know, and then when he comes to Earth, he always goes to London. Like what? What's what's going on with that? Why is he? You know what? Why can't he come to Alamogordo? He's got to come to. Well, to I can I can explain that. It's because that's the only times when the fucking makes sense. <laughs> right. Like yeah. Mm. Oh man. <laughs> I, good, but no, I'm actually I'm I'm really happy that that they did choose a woman. Um, one I called it probably over a year ago, um, so I'm happy that I was right about it. Uh, but also I, I I think this is this is really good. Uh, when you know a show as popular as Doctor Who, uh, you know a lot of women like it, a lot of little girls like it, but it's like the vast majority of the audience is male, and uh, mm-hmm. when you when you have a main character, you know, like take Wonder Woman for example, um, it's really great that 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 movie was so successful because I think that like in this uh, sci-fi you know geekdom that we have, it's it's. It tends to be very male dominated, and when you get a strong female character, a uh, you know a hero that little girls can say, you know, sh- well she's she's like me, she looks like me. I want to be like her. Um, I, I think that's important. Um, you know, I think it's it, it's important like in real life too. Like if uh, you know, like if we had a female president, for example, that's a little girls can say like, oh, it doesn't have to be a man. I could be the president, you know, and they can aspire to be that. And so and I think it's just as important in, in fictional depictions as well to show strong female characters. So like like the reaction that that little girl had, um, she was obviously a Doctor Who fan and she was eagerly watching this this um, announcement video to see, who, you know, which dude was going to play mm-hmm. the Doctor. And when she saw that it was going to be a girl, just the, you know, the audio listeners, uh, you know, go find this on YouTube so that you can just see this little girl's face light up and you could hear it in her voice as well. She was so happy. This was like life changing news for her. <laughs> she was so thrilled with it. Granted, and, she's eight, so it's not. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. I mean, what, it, what, you know, how much life does she have to draw upon? Um, to, no, I mean, but it's, yeah. I mean, this, this is great. I've heard from adult women. Hell, my, my girlfriend is one of the biggest Whovians that I know, and she is overwhelmed with joy about this news, you know? And, uh, yeah, that's great. I think, I just think it's, it's, it's wonderful. And then, like we've already established, mm-hmm. it's not destroying canon in any way. It's very much in tune with the story of Doctor Who, and the character himself has shown disappointment in past in past regenerations that he wasn't a woman. It's like, Oh, I'm a woman. This, Oh no, I'm not a woman. Damn it. Mm-hmm. You know? So the character wanted to be a female anyway. So th- this is very much in, in, in keeping with characters and everything. And I just think it's great. I'm really looking forward to seeing where they go with the story. It, I, I must admit that I will uh, check out this uh, season while I didn't watch for the last, uh, I think three seasons uh, at least. Um, so, Maybe that attracts also a new uh, audience. 
or or uh, get some uh, people or viewers uh, back into the story just to well there's something going on or there is something changing and well and I always Very found uh, Doctor Who uh, intriguing, but at the same time, it's I don't know. After after a while, it um, yeah, it, it gets old uh, or or uh, stale is maybe a better word. Yeah. But that's yeah. just my opinion. Uh, it, it's I know there are a lot of big big Doctor Who fans. The stories are well made. Uh, it's well constructed, but yeah. Yeah. I'm not binge watching it anytime soon. Right. <laughs> I, I I don't it's one of those things that I should be into. I should really really be into Doctor Who and I just I I just haven't. Mm -hmm. Like well, I mean, I think that the hurdle for a lot of people and, and Amos you've even expressed this before that there's just so much of it mm -hmm. and it's, it's overwhelming. You don't want to jump into the middle of it. You sure as hell don't want to you know, start from the very beginning and watch all, all of it. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah it's 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 daunting. I I totally get it. Um, man, there there's so much more on this. Okay, so apparently, me and Kent, you and I are completely blown away by this whole Game of Thrones thing. Manuel, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. It's so, you know first impression uh, first episode about se uh, from uh, season seven uh, I liked it of course it's uh, it's Game of Thrones what's not to like about it but um, well the characters or the actors that uh, play them at least uh, showed a little bit older of course and it showed uh, for some reason it showed like like okay uh, not in a negative way but it's. Yeah, it took me out of the story a, a little bit. Some people looked, uh, well, yeah. different. And on the other hand, uh, yeah, how shall I say? Uh, the gimmick of um, having a story, of course, taken from the books, uh, where, where you can kill off uh, any main character at any moment or uh, favorite characters and, and well, have this dynamic of uh, no one will know what's going to happen. That surprise element, The Walking Dead has that as well. Um, maybe, maybe that's a bit overplayed by now and we slowly see uh, a backlash on that. I'm maybe a bit uh, ahead of time here, but may, uh, maybe it's overdone. Uh, I, I don't know about you. but to, uh, Let's say they kill off uh, whatever major uh, uh, character in the Game of Thrones uh, in the next episode. Uh, whatever, name one. No one will be really surprised. <laughs> sure. Yeah, there's only a couple of characters I, that I feel are safe. Uh, Daenerys Targaryen, mm. I promise is not going to die this season um uh, Tyrion, i would say is pretty safe and uh, mm -hmm. probably Jon snow and those are the only three characters i think that i would be surprised and, and cersei Lannister. i agree say th those four characters i'd be surprised if they were killed off anyone else <laughs> fair game <laughs> i i can't i can't even agree with all that because well i agree that daenerys is is definitely safe because she's such a pivotal action person. Um, Tyrion, I don't think Tyrion is safe. I don't know that Jon Snow is necessarily safe. Although I do agree that either Jon Snow or Tyrion is safe. Like one mm -hmm. of the one of those two has to has to uh, has to be the the sidekick to Daenerys. But I don't necessarily think you need both of them. And I think that in a similar way, I think either Cersei or Arya are safe. One or the other, but not both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. I think there, I'll, I'll give you three out of the five. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's fair. That's fair. So. Yeah. I, I think the most safe per character is uh, Arya uh, for me. That's my bet. But okay. Maybe next time she slips on a banana peel. <laughs> <laughs> she drops off a cliff. Look, she, she, you, you got to keep Arya around just for the entertainment value because she's badass. Mm -hmm, oh, absolutely. What was it? Can't, what was what was you 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 told me uh, on Messenger? I, I said, uh, th th and this was right after watching the show. I texted Amos and said, Arya is the bamfest bamf that ever bamfed. Yeah, seriously. 
<laughs> like yes. mm-hmm. that opening scene for this 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 season is just that was great yeah. ridiculous yeah, yeah that pretty. was really great and that was a, a scene uh, everybody was waiting for in fact like okay can she finally have revenge on those uh, oh sorry it's 4 a.m here i don't remember the names <laughs> the, the, again. The, the phrase yeah. the yeah. phrase yeah so uh, yeah, yeah it, that was that, that was a great moment absolutely um, but then again, uh, you, you see this uh, with, with series like The Walking Dead as well. Like, okay, if if you tell a, a few backstories of, of uh, characters and then uh, killing off the well, the the, the B listers, let's say, and um, then that's your uh, excitement for the week. It's it's like killing off a red shirt in in Star Trek, but. Only it's not a red shirt that you never see again. It's someone who you purposely uh, inject to the story a few times and um, give a bit of a backstory and then kill him off. It, it's basically still a red shirt, but you put more effort in it. Yeah. It's not like, yeah, you and you, you're with me. <laughs> and someone, oh, <laughs> all right, we have red shirts on. We're doomed. <laughs> so no, now it's like you and you, okay, let's tell a backstory about your life and how happy you are and blah, blah, blah. And then in four episodes, we will kill you off like any red shirt. So it's, well, maybe people start to see through that. <laughs> but that's it. Uh, and, and they've already stated that there's there's no more slack. There's no more flack time. There's no goofing off time. It's just straight story from here to the to the very end. Mm. Like every scene, there's no more. There's no more filler. There's no more background fill in story or or character building. It's you know who the players are. We're just gonna barrel straight for it and see what happens. So I think that w- that will uh, change the way we perceive the show as well. Especially, I mean, I, I noticed it just in this episode. It was re- remarkable. Yeah, it's very quick paced. I think this will be their best season anyway. Um, they will go out with a bang. Hmm. Or is there one more season after this? I don't know, actually. There, there, yeah, there's there's, there's, there's one supposed one. to be one more after this. Oh, okay. Hmm, all right. Yeah, but these oh, are like I'm very short, curious then. Yeah. See, they're a few episodes shorter than than the standard seasons. Right, but then the episodes are longer, so I don't it's whatever. Yeah. Um we uh we have a few other things going on here and not the least of which is a little thing that starts out like this. Are you ready to play hot takes, Manuel? I don't know how this goes. <laughs> so explain no, me very short, no. please. Very <laughs> simple. So I'm going to give you a topic, and then you mm-hmm. are going to talk about that topic for two seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, however long I give you, until you hear that record <laughs> scratch. And then I will give you another topic. Oh, and then all right. Talk about, so you can... You can uh, say something very interesting about it, or you could just scream about it. It's up, totally up to you. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> All right. The Belgian Revolution. Am I right? Whoa. Okay. Um, very interesting topic. It started our independence, and it started our independence from uh, the Netherlands, uh, for example. And um, it was done on the twenty-first of July, uh, eighteen thirty-one. And um, Trappist <laughs> Brewer. Am I right? <laughs> uh, one of our more famous beers, brewed in. In the abbeys of the Trappist uh, order, and um, the best one is from West Mall, although most Belgians will say West Flateren is the best one. There's a discussion about that, and uh, well, taste it if you have the chance because it's, uh, of course, very, very good. And uh, it has about, uh, and I'm going uh, by heart here, uh, 8% alcohol uh, percentage uh, content, whatever. And it's. Overproduced podcasts, am I right? <laughs> well, if you hear no ums, if you hear perfect editing, if you hear these perfect voices, then you uh, usually unsubscribe after like 10 episodes because you get bored and it's... Uh, some, 
the Delirium Cafe in Brussels. Am I right? It's in Ghent. It's in Ghent. <laughs> Is there also one in Brussels? I didn't even know that. Um, the one in Ghent has uh, pink elephants painted on the on the <laughs> uh, on the walls, and um, it has, of course, the Delirium Tremens beer, which is a uh, very very strong uh, beer that's uh, consumed heavily by students in Ghent. I didn't know there was also one in Brussels, but uh, I have to visit it. Uh, if, if that's the case. <laughs> um, Delirium Tremens is also a beer that's uh, exported, I thought. It has uh, white bottles and pink elephants on it. <laughs> the Ritual Misery <laughs> podcast, am I right? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Sorry. The Ritual Misery podcast, am I right? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's the top, top, top uh, 10 podcast in the world. Um, there's a lot of overproduction going on there. It's so slick, smooth sailing. Uh, you cannot believe it. And um, the, the, the show notes are so great. Uh, <laughs> right. They have to produce it in book form. I would order it uh, on Amazon like that. Oh, and, my uh, God. That, that, that was ridiculous. I loved it. That was amazing. That's probably my favorite hot takes of all time. That Seriously? Was so all right. <laughs> More coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I've actually, I brought a couple of show and tell items uh, for the uh, hot wait, takes. Wait, 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 wait. We got to keep this clean from the nipple down. Don't, don't, don't be doing nothing crazy on the camera. <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting. And I had no idea um, which beer that Manuel was going to mention when I said Trappist. Mm -hmm. And I had three of them in my refrigerator and I chose mm -hmm. wrong. I've got Chimay, I've got mm -hmm. West Mall, and I've got this guy. How would you pronounce that, Manuel? Rochefort. Roch Rochefort. Rochefort, yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm going to consume this while mm -hmm. we have the rest of our conversation. Um, I absolutely love Trappist beers. I am such a fan. I, I went understand. to I went to all seven of the uh, European Trappist brewers while I was living in Germany a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. There has since been a couple new ones spring up, uh, but at the time that I lived there, there were seven of them, six of which are in Belgium, and I went to all seven of them. Uh, I, I sampled the beers. I bought glassware. No, from them. Yeah, the correct glasses. Mm, uh, nice. Ken, Tour Ken. Is amazing. How many of them did you go to? Seven. And 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 how many was that? Say what? How, how many was that? How many was what? How, how, how many? How many were there? <laughs> there was seven. What? In Belgium, there are uh, six indeed, and six in, in total in the world, there are like 14 now, I think. <clears throat> no, I was, I was poking fun because you said like three times <laughs> that you went to all seven. <laughs> uh, okay. <yeah. laughs> Thanks for making me say it four more times. Right. Um, hey, this isn't about you. Sometimes it's just about me, all right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's, there's one in the Netherlands and six in Belgium, and uh, they're, they're all just super great. Great beer, uh, great people. Uh, the monks are, are usually very accommodating and will talk to you. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's really good. Um, when you visited uh, the one in West Mall, um, did you visit the um, on the other side of the road? There's a big uh, cafe, actually. And there they serve uh, special West Mall cheese along with the Trappist. It's uh, very, very good. No, I did, I did <laughs> not there I, I went the, to the, the cafe cheese is excellent I, I think i might have bought some of the cheese in the mm -hmm. store they have there um oh, the yeah, cafe that i visited were um uh Chimay, um uh Vesflederen, <coughs> and uh was it orval it might have been orval there was another one that mm -hmm. i visited their cafe hmm I've yeah, only ever visited this shop. Uh, usually wins uh, some international beer prizes as being the best of uh, all the Trappist beers. Um, and um, and uh, Westmall is usually also up there somewhere in the top. Yeah, I, definitely. Uh, Westmall, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Westflederen has uh, for years been 
rated as the number one beer in the world on ratebeer.com. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So what, what were you about to say, Amos? I have all of those beers in my fridge as well. I bet you don't have Vesflater in. Well, no, I have all the ones that you named. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the West, okay. Uh, the West one is uh, very limited uh, in supply, and it's uh, actually rather hard to come by. You you have to uh, order it. There's a waiting list and and so on. Jeez, is it that good? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, if they make a few thousand bottles and and you win a prize as being the best beer in the world, you can imagine that they get orders all over the from all all over the world. Sorry, and um, yeah. Uh, mm. Demand and supply. <laughs> so the other the other show and tell item that I brought was the menu that I got from the Delirium Cafe in Brussels, and I want to show <laughs> this. Yeah, pink elephants. <laughs> cool. And what's cool about this menu? If you can, for the video people, you can see how thick this menu is. It's it's what about a about half an inch Look. thick, maybe three eighths of an inch. Um. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's uh, nearly an inch thick. <clears throat> they have uh, tw- over twenty five hundred beers, and they in the year two thousand four they won the Guinness or, or they achieved a Guinness World Record for having the most beers available at any given time, and that was no no coincidence. Two thousand four, they mm-hmm. are guaranteed to have minimum of two thousand four beers available at any given time in their pub. Wow. That's it, it is beer paradise. That is ridiculous. Uh, mm-hmm. I been to the one in Ghent, but I I've been to the one in Brussels a couple of times and oh my god. <laughs> like I want to live there. Yeah. yeah the, the one in Ghent is just a student uh, bar. <laughs> so not even comparable to what you've uh, telling me about the one in Brussels. I honestly didn't know about the Delirium one in Brussels. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's so so good. How how far away is Brussels from you? For me, it's about uh, normal traffic, a thirty minute drive, twenty minutes if you really. Uh, so that's not bad. Push it. Yeah, yeah. You should go check it out one of these days. Mm-hmm, indeed. I, I like how we have a, a Belgian guest on, and you're telling the Belgian guest where to go in Belgium. <laughs> In Belgium, yeah, like this. But there, there's a big difference uh, where you live. Um, someone in Brussels will not know about bars in Antwerp, for example, and, and the other way around. So it's um, well, I, I live in Antwerp, and we uh, we don't come uh, to Brussels that so, often. So, so I like so if, Brussels. If we visit way, Antwerp, but, uh, if we visit Antwerp, where are we going? Like what's cool? What, what? The closest thing to delirium in Antwerp is the Culminator. It's um, a very well, uh, a, a very special experience is a small bar who has, um, they have all kinds of beers. I don't know about uh, 2,000 of them, but it will be close. And uh, they specialize in, well, all, uh, having any beer you want uh, there as well. And, uh, for example, there are people from uh, Saudi Arabia, especially coming over to Antwerp to uh, visit the Kilminator to taste some beers. And uh, I guess uh, in Delirium in Brussels, uh, it will be no different. Uh, maybe they have uh, even more beers. Uh, so th- that that's one place. Uh, and in Antwerp, there are uh, well, a few of those. Jeez. Jeez. Very cool. I got to go somewhere with better beer. I mean, I mean I, the Alaskan beer is pretty good. I, I haven't had any, many of them that I'm like, oh, that's gross. But, I mean, hearing these stories, I got I to gotta get somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, Europe is a, a great place to be for that. Um, so while we're, while we're on the subject of Belgium, there's, there's just one last thing that I want to uh, bring up for myself about Belgium. Uh, my ancestors are actually from Belgium on my father's side. If you, so if you trace my you know, father to father to father, uh, the family that migrated to the United States was from Belgium, uh, mm-hmm. in the the, Char- the Charleroi area, yeah, in uh, southern Belgium. So we're really close to France. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. About that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, 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 I, that's I that's tied. great actually. <laughs> and um, do you have any? Well, uh, stories about uh, 
well their their way or or how they made their way to the states or uh, because so it's also my, also fascinating to hear sometimes. Yeah. So my my great great however many uh, greats mm -hmm. grandfather, he was a glassmaker in mm -hmm. uh, in the Charleroi uh, region. I can't remember the name of the city uh, right off the top of my head, uh, but. But yeah, he was a glassmaker, and he took his family. I don't know the circumstances of why they left Belgium, uh, but he took his family to America, and they settled in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, which is where Pittsburgh is. So, like, just mm -hmm. outside of Pittsburgh, uh, and opened up a a glass factory there. So and they and they ran that for a couple of generations until they. Uh, I, I guess I don't know if they lost the craft or or whatever, but they mm -hmm. they only lost a couple generations making glass, and then they moved on to other other stuff. Being in, until they were grocers and farmers and stuff like that. Until the rich white man bought them out, that's what happened. Killed the <laughs> family business. Yeah. That's all they're good for. That's probably what it is. Yeah, <laughs> some rich Englishman or something. Right. Might have been <laughs> might have been a Frenchman. I don't know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I would like to talk for a minute about Manuel's podcast because you, I mean, if you've, if you want to know how he got into podcasting, you can just listen to Undaunted. Um, it's yeah. great. It's mm -hmm. actually a really good episode, but there are certain things that don't fall in the realm of Undaunted that I would still like to know. Like, um, you know, we, we talk about how you, how you measure success and how you get into podcasting and stuff like that, but how fun is, is just digging into the random history, this literally the random history of the, this tiny little country that you live in. The, the, that's the fun part, the random part, because uh, if I would do it in chronological order, I would uh, given up, uh, I would have given up a few months ago, I'm sure, because uh, you're rather forced to, well, stick to the timeline and, and even, uh, well, wait through the sometimes boring stuff and to get to the good stories and if you do it at random you can just pick anything um, at the moment I'm a bit stuck on the Belle Epoque era just right before the First World War because it's so interesting so I will do a few episodes rather in chronological order um, but then I can just leave that again and talk about, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> uh, for example, uh, migration from the Charleroi area to uh, to the <laughs> States or whatever I like, you know, or, or about Trappist. <laughs> That's the great stuff and that keeps me motivated. And uh, of course, if you see the, the subscribers grow slowly but steady, then I think I'm, I'm uh, measuring my success relatively speaking of course it's a very very niche market as i said on undaunted it's a uh, well it's about belgium it's in english it's about history and okay i'm not a celebrity or anything so you will not get a, a million subscribers tomorrow but um, yeah, it's fun to see it grow and it's fun to make it and uh, and to create uh, all that I, I think i think it being random actually increases the listenability as well because you don't you're not going to, you know you don't know what the next topic is going to be yeah. so it could be something along the same lines or something completely out of left field but because you 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 state that right up front you're like this is this is random this is it's in the title <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. either you can't have like an ill recourse to that. It's just, oh, we're going to talk about this now. Okay, cool. Let's find out about this. Oh, hey, we just returned back to that other subject. Oh, and now we're going to go here. And, I, yeah. you know, that's, that's part of what keeps me listening personally. Yeah, no one yeah. can complain like uh, you did a show about this or that subject. Yeah, okay, if you don't like it, listen uh, in two weeks and it will be different. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's part of the concept. I, I played around with it in the beginning, like, okay, shall I do it in chronological order and start it like in, in ancient times in this area and then slowly build up to the Roman Empire and what was going on in this area by, back then. I will visit that time, but uh, not yet. And I, I just couldn't do it. it it's uh, it's too much work to to stick to it that way, and I applaud anyone who can do it uh, uh, the right way, so to speak, in chronological order. 
but okay. Uh, for example, if I listen to another podcast about uh, a country, uh, let's say the history of China, they do it in chronological order. Sometimes you hear like, okay, this period of time doesn't interest me at all. And yeah, maybe maybe you, uh, you stop listening months, for right? a while. Yeah, exactly. But okay, it differs. Uh, any anyone is different, of course. Uh, there will be some listeners who maybe uh, are irritated by the randomness. Well, okay, tough luck. <laughs> that, that's so so be it. So, I, I want. Yeah. So so the, those those listeners should just wait until the very end of the podcast. You know, whenever you stop mm-hmm. doing it, and then they can just you know reshuffle it the way they need to re- they need to listen to it <laughs> well i'm actually making well there is a file with the chronological order so if you want to listen to it in chronological order i add an episode every time i finish an episode and one day i will release that and people who uh-huh. really want to listen to it in that order can do it and then they start with like episode 30 and then go to five and then one and whatever so, <laughs> so I, well, i've got a the question order about- by heart <laughs> I've got a question about that then. I, I listened to the episode about beer, uh, which I thought was excellent. Um, and I knew the, the basic history of, of beer in Belgium, but the way that you deep dived on InBev was super interesting to me. Uh, but my point is that you start from like, you know, BC to like modern day history of InBev. So where would you put this episode like in your chronology? Wherever the hell he wants. Oh, yeah. Um, I would uh, concentrate on the main subject. So th- there are a few subjects like that uh, where you cannot pinpoint a certain year or a date on it. Um, but I would, uh, for example, start with the uh, inception of uh, InBev. And uh, that would be around, uh, now you're putting me on the spot, uh, 16 something, 16. Uh, 1635, I think. Yeah, something like that. Like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the book was called it. I don't. Yeah. Okay. So 1635. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so and then I I would put it uh, over there. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's debatable, of course. Uh, if you yeah. uh, some things uh, you pick uh, a subject that has a long time span, where where do you uh, chronologically place it. Um, but the, most of them are pretty clear. Uh, if, if something happened in uh, 1986, well, that's the place to go. So mm-hmm. most of them are very clear on that. But now I, I'm putting down that list and maybe that helps some people. Um, it, certainly if I would go over 50 episodes, uh, then maybe it's use, useful for new people. Like, okay, this is so random. Where do I start? Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe they can do that uh, in chronological order. Why not? Yeah, very cool. That that would be, that, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah, that's that's a geeky thing of the week. What did you do this week? Well, I downloaded all the episodes of a podcast about Belgium, and then I listened to it in chronological order. Although yeah. the podcast is at random, oh. that was very <laughs> or, geeky. Or, or how would it go if like you <laughs> downloaded all the episodes of the Random History of Belgium and then let it just shuffle its way through? Yeah. <laughs> So, so you like you know not only is it salted but it's also hashed like it's you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> secure <laughs> yeah. yeah you can build a uh, build a uh, bitcoin on that or a blockchain on that <laughs> <laughs> right oh so, so speaking speaking of blockchains and bitcoin uh so there, I guess there's a debate going on with the the scaling of cryptocurrencies like bitcoin oh yeah for two years <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell tell us a little bit about that. What do you know about um, Bitcoin and, and their situation with that? Oh, I ca- I cannot do that in in uh, in a few words. I mean, in fact, it's it's so well. In in general, there are a few solutions for the uh, for the scalability. And uh, before I say anything wrong here, this is not investment advice. Don't uh, invest any (laughs) money that you cannot afford to lose. But um, no, they they proposed a few solutions to um, uh, to solve the congestion congestion problem uh, when there are too many transactions and so on. Um, There are a, a few other fixes as well for other problems, but generally it's about that. And they proposed a solution and basically some uh, miners or big consortiums of miners uh, don't want one flavor of the solution, but um, want another one, which resulted in 
a reaction of a user uh, activated soft fork um, which is a, actually a, a pure backwards compatible soft fork uh, for bitcoin and there is also a hard fork proposed which is more dangerous uh, with another solution and uh, the first of august we will see more about that now a few minutes ago actually uh, the bip 91 solution was locked in which means that the one flavor the segwit 2x and don't ask me the details about that um it will will be locked in for uh, many miners so we already have change going on at this very moment so um to be honest i see bitcoin splitting up in two maybe three flavors bitcoin one bitcoin two bitcoin three so to speak and they will have uh, each uh, different solutions one will stay like it is now one will have SegWit with uh, um, certain headers in the transactions will be compressed or something like that. I don't know that much about the technical solution that they propose, but then you will not have the congestion anymore. And then the third solution will be actually that the the, the block uh, size will even uh, increase, I think, uh, to four or eight megs, which will also solve that, but make it incompetent incompatible with the first one it's a mess in fact because if you have bitcoin you want it uh, to be uh, secure and usable and if you go uh, onto an online shop who supports bitcoin and you, you want to spend your bitcoin and all of a sudden uh, your bitcoins are worthless in that shop but not worthless in another shop mm, that's bad and uh, i hope they will sort out the mess uh, pretty soon i'm confident in that because i uh, well my my vision is i follow up this uh, bitcoin uh, field so to speak uh, for years now mm. and i always was very um, cautious about it because i'm uh, i'm of the economic principle was what comes up uh, must go down and uh, <laughs> Uh, the, you see that in the stock market, you see that, uh, well, the pie does get bigger, but it cannot get uh, bigger than the oven it is baked in. And sometimes they forget that. Mm. So, uh, and that's with any economy. It's not Bitcoin related that I say that it's uh, with, with, uh, with anything. Uh, so I'm very cautious about that. I missed out on uh, tremendous uh, profitability because of that uh, way of thinking. On the other hand, I, I trade Bitcoin and I, I play around with it. But um, if I lose all of it tomorrow, I will not cry about it because I'm, I'm calculated and well, I will not be happy either, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's not it's it's not like uh, some people invested their whole life savings in it and um well that's always dangerous in any stock or any investment yeah uh, i can just my see opinion it. just I, my I, opinion i can just see somebody woohoo i'm yeah. broke yeah <laughs> <laughs> well but it, it's on the, the other side of that debate is when you look at and, and this is for real i was um i was uh, on my birthday party in 2010 jokingly i said to my friends let's put together for a bitcoin miner mm. and i was laughed out of the building because everybody said uh, first of all what's bitcoin and second of all this will never make it you generate some some fake uh, ones and zeros on a computer and what is it worth well nothing you spend more electricity for real than it is worth blah 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 so I, I i looked at it and i said well maybe you're right i i will not invest in it afterwards it's of course easy to say that was a stupid mistake to not do that but that's afterwards and that's easy you can say like oh you you should have bought google when it uh, when its ipo came out well yeah might as well uh, google would have gone broke uh, next the next week who knows so uh I'm, I'm, uh, and also, if you do that, let's say you had, in the beginning of 2011, you had 3,000 bitcoins. Okay. What did you do with it? Buy a coffee? <laughs> it's like, you would lose it anyway. Uh, you, you, you would spend it, you would, uh, f you could buy a PlayStation at some point for like 10 bitcoins. <laughs> a PlayStation 3 or whatever. And at that moment, it was maybe a, a, 
a good deal. I don't know. Uh, so I know many people who have a lot of bitcoins and they either lost it through, well, spending it or Mount Cox, uh, that uh, famous exchange that went belly up and so on and so on. So the real holders, the real people who had a few thousand bitcoins and just kept it, those are the really smart guys and yeah, the really super. believers. And I can assure you there aren't that many of them. Yeah. Yeah. 3,000 Bitcoins today is... Uh, yeah. It's That's a lot of money. I'm actually going to Google this right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll look up, uh, let's see, to US dollars and then I'll, I'll say the euro. So right now, 3,000 Bitcoins would be worth $8,159,940. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which in euro would be... Uh, seven over seven million euros. Yeah, six so, million seven hundred thousand something, so, to be yeah. precise. I, so. I was I was actually looking at this, and so my wife and I were talking uh, a couple weeks ago about you know saving pictures and things like that, like having copies in the cloud and this and that, and and how people aren't com- comfortable with with cloud computing. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, and then you know, but we've been cloud computing for decades. It's called banking and you have an ATM machine that pulls money out like that's all just because you can identify where the cloud is located like the bank is essentially just a server farm for ATM machines at that point or ATMs at that yeah, point yeah. Um, you know, yeah sure sure I mean, I mean you can draw the, 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 the distinct parallel there and then Bitcoin like what is that it's just fake money like somebody just made some shit up but then no, all money yeah. is fake but all yeah that's what I was gonna say all money is fake like there is no inherent Indeed. value to any money it's right. what we collectively it's an agreement yeah. yeah it's yeah. just an agreement and and if you if you use something fake uh, it's always fake the paper money we have is is as fake as you can get because and they they print a lot of it extra in in euro for example there is 80 million euro printed every month extra in the eurozone and then they say oh our economy is doing well because we have uh, higher inflation this year well you created it yourself you just print it yeah. so yeah. and that's what they always uh, criticized uh, some uh, african countries for like uh, for example congo uh, mobutu uh, when he was in power when he had uh, some financial problems he just ordered extra printing presses and printed extra money and and they laughed about it but they are doing exactly the same right now and in in the us it will be no different i guess um so the, the trust in in that paper money is declining i think on the other hand bitcoin well what trust can you uh, put in that i i'm not sure i cannot i, I don't dare to say uh, too much about that because it only the future will tell i trust it to a certain degree, uh, but I trust the technical part of it. I, I trust that when I have a Bitcoin somewhere on a paper wallet, that I'm, I, I'm pretty confident that in five years time, that will still be there and will still be worth what I've put on it. Yeah. While when I put the same amount in my bank account and I look back at it in five years, I'm pretty sure it will be worth less. In, in in essence of what I can buy with it. Right. But what does that tell you? Well, not that the economy is going good or bad or that Bitcoin is good or bad. It's just how the economy works. It's, it's so complex and everything influences each other. And maybe tomorrow uh, Ethereum takes over from Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin is close to worthless. I don't know. You cannot uh, predict the future, of course. And uh, But you can... You can, well, uh, try to steer it a bit. If, if you trust Bitcoin, well, why don't you put your money in it uh, or, or a part of your money in it? Right. So th- that's a bit of my idea. But yeah, don't don't I, uh, gamble. Uh, I would be I would be really interested to see a documentary, like a, 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 a say impartial, but everything's partial, right? Mm-hmm. But a a really fact based documentary on the history of the world banks Whoa, you know, yeah. start, starting like it even if it just started in 1932 or whatever when roosevelt cut the the dollar gold tie and you know created created our system of fake money the way it currently stands um e- even if it just started there and kind of saw how it went, went from there i would be super interested in seeing a, a an actual documentary on the history of the world banks 
I think it'd be great. I, I would sit there mm -hmm. and watch all two hours glued to the TV uh, at the time. There are documentaries like that at the moment, but they are indeed so uh, colored by anyone who's making it. They want to either have the image like, oh, trust the central banks. They are good for the economy. They, right. they get loans out to the banks. They steer the economy and then they take it back and it's all okay. It's normal. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is, of course, yeah, they, they ruin the economy. They take the power and blah, 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 all that uh, stuff. But something in the middle, like, okay, we are going to fact check everything and we are going to give you the cold hard facts. Um, I don't know if those cold hard facts are all available still because uh, it, it actually starts with the gold standard and how that came to an end. Mm -hmm. And uh, my feeling is, but that's just my personal opinion, that the gold standard um, was actually the best monetary system. Um, you, you have a real currency where the whole world agrees that it is worth something, uh, gold, and uh, you have that in a vault somewhere, and then you have paper, and that paper uh, represents that amount of gold, and that there you can trade with, and so on. Of course, that gave some other problems. If the economy was really, really good, they had not enough paper money supply to, <laughs> uh, to represent all that gold, and that created all kinds of problems in the good times. So that blocked uh, our progress a bit. And that's the official story that why they came up with the central banking unlimited supply uh, stuff. But okay, you have to be really, really into economics, and I'm not that uh, good in it, but I know a bit about it. Yeah. But even economy professors will tell you that it is uh, very, very complex. And yeah, the Bitcoin side of the story is, uh, if you hear some libertarians uh, talk about that, it's like, okay, we have to abolish all that. We have to abolish the central banks. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. And put all your money into Bitcoin, and that's the future. I, I'm not on that side either, because... If you see what's going on inside Bitcoin itself uh, at the moment, it's uh, who it's it's uh, the technical part alone. It's it's a very deep discussion, and in fact, about twenty people control that stuff. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah, that wow, that was a bit more of a deep dive than. Uh, yeah, sorry. We, <laughs> we actually we covered um, we covered Bitcoin uh, and other cryptocurrencies on this show like two and a half years ago or something like that. One of our first episodes. Yeah. Uh, so it's a topic that we've on and off kind of uh, touched on. And we uh, still don't get one, it. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is one of the, the deepest conversations <laughs> we've actually had about it. Very cool. My, um, my personal view at the moment on it is I have, and, and everybody can know that, I have 2.1 Bitcoin, which is one millionth of the money supply in Bitcoin, put aside on a paper wallet. And that's enough. Because mm -hmm. if it ever booms to the moon, like all these guys uh, yell about, then one millionth of the money supply is uh, well, <laughs> something I'm really happy about. But on the other hand, it's not that much money, because I bought it uh, a while ago, so it's under $1,000 that I spend on it. So it's not something I will cry about if it's, if it, if it's gone. I, I will not be happy, of course. No one <laughs> likes to lose $1,000. But it's sure. not like my life is ruined. Right. So it either goes... Uh, all or nothing on that like uh, it will either soar and then I'm really happy with my 2.1 um, but uh, and the rest I trade and, and and that's with extra money I have I put in there and I ride the waves so to speak last week it went from 2,600 euros to 1,600 euros and then uh, you buy back in so I, I sold at 2,500 or something and I bought back in at 1,650 or something Okay, and now it's back to 2,300. Wow, that, that's great. But that's my trade money. Right. That's not the, the thing I put aside for a later date. Um, there's always a bigger fool to buy something. Like with Ethereum, it's the same. It, it, I went in at $16. Uh, a friend of mine who is really uh, into that, um, really, really into that, uh, said, okay, buy it now because it will soar. I followed and uh, usually he's right nine of the 10 times and uh, he was right again. It soared above $300 and then you sell because you would be stupid if you even make 20% in the stock market, for example, you're very happy. You're doing better than the average. 
And if you do 200 or 2000 percent, please sell. <laughs> what more do these people ask for? I don't know. Like I hear people say when I said I sell at three hundred dollars, there was one guy on Twitter who said, you, you will regret this if it goes to three thousand. Like, come on, dude. <laughs> yeah. yeah of course if it goes to 3000 i will regret it but hey i already have my profit and i don't want more 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 i'm happy with the profit i make be happy that you have profit but most people don't accept five percent even 50 percent no they want five thousand percent well and that I, I, ruins a lot i think people should be happy with the random history of belgium podcast and uh manuel can you tell us where we can find that um yeah you can find that if you search in iTunes on uh, uh, or your favorite podcast app, Random History of Belgium. Um, if you don't know how to do that, uh, just go to rhob.be. That's uh, the website for that. There you can also uh, subscribe. And every two weeks I drop an episode unless specified otherwise. But um, well, I try to stick that to, uh, to that um, schedule. And uh, on Twitter, it's R-H-O-B podcast. And that's awesome. And how many episodes do you have now? I'm busy with the 35th episode. And you just, episode 35 is and you coming ju- up. You just started recently too, and it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, <laughs> Thanks. I, uh, oh, very, I, I, I love it. I've only listened to... Actually, I've only listened to one episode so far. But uh, it's in my podcatcher and... Um, aliens. Yeah. I, t- I took a random shot at Aliens, <laughs> man. You got to listen to the Aliens one. It's amazing. Like, yeah. it had me hooked right then and there. Um, Kent, where can people you. find you at, man? At best places on Twitter, at RM underscore Del Noche. Um, I'm getting more and more active on there uh, than I have been recently. So check me out mm-hmm. there. And um, I'm sure to... Say something that'll catch your fancy one way or another. You were Twitter king for like a while there. You were just like like you live there, and then all of a sudden you just dropped it like a like a, a three week old pancake, and it, it just went away. Like what what happened, dude? I'm back. I'm back. I'm <laughs> no. so uh, he, yeah. So. He picked up his three week old pancake and he's gonna eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, you can you can find me on Twitter at Ethan King. You can follow the show uh, at Ritual Misery, and uh, you can cruise on over to RitualMisery.com to find out all the cool stuff we're involved in, including Undaunted and uh, a soon to be uh, announced podcast or maybe released. I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, from Kent, um, thank you to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use your music, and for Manuel, for me, and for thank Kent, you. thank you for being on our podcast. That's that music. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>